Good morning. On this uh, Sunday, March 22, 2020, I would like to offer you a sermon based on the text from the first book of Samuel, chapter 16, verses 1 to 13. But in this, these ever-changing times, I never know what I'm writing on Thursday afternoon is still valid on Sunday morning or whenever you're watching this. Nevertheless, nevertheless, I believe we are convinced, I will believe that all of us are convinced, that good leadership is essential in moments of crisis. Uh, we might have different uh, views about what is uh, the best one to offer this. But usually, according to our, the standards of our Western societies, a good leader is a tall, white, middle-aged man with a deep voice uh, that reassure us that, in, that we can trust. But unfortunately, experience taught us that too often these uh, picture-perfect individuals do not always deliver on their promises, and we end up often disappointed. And when this happens, well, you, we usually look for a new candidate to save us by searching someone who has exactly the same attributes. Somehow, we seem to be unable to learn from our mistakes and open our minds to a different reality, to a new way of thinking. Today's text from the first book of Samuel begin in a time of crisis, a leadership crisis to be more precise. Several years before, the Israelite came to Samuel and asked him to appoint a king. The prophet warned them that it was not a good idea. God was the only ruler they needed. But Samuel's people were not interested in listening to him. They wanted to be like all the other nations around them. They wanted a king like everybody else. So, a man who presented all the expected attribute of leadership in the ancient Near East was selected. Saul was a handsome man who was tall and strong. He was a military leader uh, who enjoyed wide populist support. So he became the first king of Israel. And the beginning of Saul's kingship was not that bad. But soon power got to his head. His reign turned to be a miserable failure to the point that even God had enough of him. It was time for new leadership for God's people. So one day God commands Samuel to go to Bethlehem. There he would find a man named Jesse and one of his sons would become the new king of the Israelites. The prophet followed God's instruction, and when he encountered Jesse's eldest son, Eliab, well, he assumed immediately that he must be the chosen one. He's king material. You know, Eliab is tall, he has the right demeanor, he's attractive, like a perfect 10. Woo. So it's a wrap, he think. Let's pack everything because the search is over. But God says, no more tall and handsome guy. Okay, we were not walking that road again. He's not the one. Okay. And what followed could be compared to a very strange ancient version of The Bachelor. <laughs> because one after the other, each one of Jesse's son come before Samuel, from the oldest to the youngest, and each time the prophet expected the candidate would be selected because beautiful, right stuff, and each time God tells him that he's not the one. And at one point, Samuel surely thought, really, Lord, really? I don't believe you will find better than these boys. What do you want? And yet God says to the prophet, do not look on their appearance or on the height of their stature. 
because I have rejected them all. For the Lord does not see as the mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. I don't know if it's part of our human DNA, but too often we judge people according to appearance. For example, let's say you're called for a job interview. Would you go wearing a t-shirt, sweatpants, and socks in your sandals? Or would you put a nice shirt, a tie, or a beautiful dress? Because in both cases, you are the same person, with the same qualification and the same ability, but the result will be most likely different because, like it or not, we are influenced by our first impressions. It's very difficult to go beyond them, even if we know that look and eloquence could be uh, deceitful and misleading. For many reasons, we seem to constantly fall back on accepted standards perceptions and beauty we prefer to feel secure what feels secure appropriate and fitting well this might be our ways but this is not God's ways oh no 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 God does not play this kind of game no after the rejection of the first seven sons of Jesse Samuel asked if there's any left and reluctantly, Jesse answered, well, there's the little one, but he's tending the sheep. You know, he's just a boy. Well, send him and bring him, replied the prophet. And David was cute, but he did not have what it took to, uh, what it takes to meet the people's expectation back then, you know. And yet he's the one who is selected by God. The youngest son of an obscure Bethlehemite farmer. The child everyone has discounted and forgotten because of his inexperience. The one who seemed to be quite insignificant and often disregarded defeats the odds. David is anointed to be the next king of Israel. And by doing so, God proves once again that good things often come in unlikely wrappings and from unlikely origins. Imagine just for an instant what would happen if we could go beyond our inclination to judge according to our first impression, appearance, or prejudices. Just try to imagine the world we will live in if we were able to see one another, not as human beings normally see, but as God looks upon each and every one of us. Because there would be no more, well, she's just a child, she cannot teach us anything. No more, he's disabled, he cannot help us with our project. No more... They are a great couple. They could bring great leadership to our church if only they were not homosexuals. No, we would be able to see people for who they truly are. We would be able to see how God is working in our world. We would be able to discern how God is still finding new ways to surprise us every day. We would be able to understand that God keeps choosing the ones who people would not expect to achieve incredible deeds. Imagine, just for an instant, what would happen if we finally grasp that God does not follow the established patterns of our world. As the uh, First Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann said about today's passage, This is not merely a story of a boy who becomes king and under God, underdog who wins. It's a story about God and the way God sees us and chooses unconventional ways and unexpected people to do things, to get things done in this world. 
And it's so true when we think about it. The real hero in this story is not David, Samuel, or Jesse, but God who defies cultural convention. It is the God, the same God, who prefer Abel over his older brother Cain, who chose Jacob over Esau. Joseph over all his ten older brothers. This is a God who called unlikely prophets, like Moses, who never been eloquent, Isaiah, whose lips were impure, and Jeremiah, who was too young to be God's spokesperson. This is a God who selected a small nation, the small nation of Israel, to become a beacon of light unto the rest of the nation of the world. This is the story of a God who caught the world completely off guard with the birth of a Messiah in a remote corner of the Roman Empire in a place called Bethlehem. In challenging and unsettling times, who do we expect to lead our nation, our community, our churches? How do we decide who is the right person for a task? Well, today's text is a powerful reminder that God is not interested in who's the tallest, the strongest, the more powerful, or the richest. No, God's keep calling the ones we sometimes expect the least. God constantly gave us a chance to prove ourselves in one way or another. God is always ready to look beyond the appearance. Basically, God tells us, I see what's in your heart, and that's the only thing that matters to me. May we all have the courage to do the same every day. Amen. Thank you for watching. Take care of yourself and remain healthy. Bye-bye.